Do I need a microphone? Yes. I do? Yes. So half the time I'm going to speak into this, the clicker, instead of the microphone. You know that, right? <laughs> you get very confused. Well, Ryan did a great job introducing me. I don't have much to add to that. Um, we are... <laughs> the picture's good, though, right? <laughs> you can't make fun of yourself. Um, the communication skills we're doing, we're going to do IT auditing tomorrow, corporate, corporate culture. It's all from the uh, perspective of an ex internal auditor. So I, I, I think, uh, and what I want you guys to do today too is participate as much as possible, give me uh, any questions you have, but I will be able to answer them from the perspective of an internal auditor. Uh, let's see here, I'm from the great state of Texas, but I don't sound like I'm from Texas, which I think that's a good thing. What else? We'll talk about the book later. Um, well, I did bring some, if you guys are interested, at. Uh, Steeply discounted prices because, uh, again, I think it's a good book. I think it's a good book. I wrote it, obviously. <laughs> it's great. But it's gotten great reviews, and I've got only about 150 copies left, which I'm very excited to be done. And we can actually, we're actually working on a uh, follow up to this book on communication skills for internal auditors. A little bit about us we have 170 full day courses on audit accounting, finance, and communication or people centric skills. We also work in executive recruiting, staff augmentation, and special projects. Let's talk about communication. Um, if anything I say doesn't apply to you because of the culture you're in, uh, you know, again, I speak towards North American culture, but a lot of things we talk about are going to apply. If it doesn't, please bring it up. Let's talk about it and let's make sure we understand the cultural differences because a lot of the things we're going to talk about, they're really based on cultural differences on if it's acceptable or if it's not. Um, let's talk about the seven C's of effective communication, kind of ease into this. I've been doing this presentation for 10 years now. Uh, the first time I did it, I liked participation. I asked somebody in the front row, what are some of the seven C's? Just like I'm about to ask you guys. And I had a gentleman like this, this one right here, raise his hand, I said, yes sir, what are some of the seven C's? And he blurts out, accuracy. <laughs> Listening is a big part of communication. <laughs> now, he's an auditor, he was an auditor, and he said, well, there's three C's in, in accuracy, so. <laughs> he's right and I'm wrong. So what are some of the seven C's to effective communication? Accuracy. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this a long time, I've never had anybody blurt out accuracy again. <laughs> Listening, yes. What else? What are some of the seven C's? Concise. We'll talk about that um, throughout our, the session today because there's an indirect correlation. You guys tell me if you agree with me. There's an indirect correlation between length of communication and understanding. The longer it gets, the less people understand. You guys agree or disagree? <laughs> Great. So, and, and, and I think the culture too with social media, etc., has kind of led to this. The more you communicate, the longer you communicate, the more you tend to lose your audience. So concise. What else? Constructive. Constructive. Making sure that we're using um, action verbs. Making sure that we're not using emotional words where people focus on the message and not what's being said, if that makes sense. We want to make sure that we get them to understand the report. Get them to understand what the community, the findings are versus getting upset at them. What else? Yeah. Clear. Clarity is key. I don't know if I have it in here, but we as auditors talk in our own language. Uh, that language people, normal people, don't understand all the time. But that's never stopped us from talking in that language. So making sure that we're talking at a level that everybody can understand. What else? Say again? Complete. Complete's a good one too. Uh, making sure that we introduce, support, and reiterate our message. Any others? I can't walk. Next to the speakers. So, that does not start with C, sir. <laughs> that's two way. Well, no, we're going to talk about mode of communication because that's important. Email is a one-way mode of communication, but we've turned it into a two-way mode. So you've really got to look at, and we're going to talk specifically to this, 
depending on what you're communicating, what mode to communicate in. So let's talk about some of them. You guys did bring up clear and coherent, but I think that's inherent in everything we do. Um, no question of uh, attention or objective. Eliminating irrelevance, clear. Communicating where there is no doubt as to the message we're trying to send. And I get accused of soft selling or softening messages at times. The goal isn't to soften it, the goal is to gain acceptance of it. So as straightforward and comprehensible as possible. So which of these emails, in your opinion, is more clear? First one or the second one? I'll give you guys a minute to take that in. What do you think? One or two? Raise your hand for one. Raise your hand for two. Why is two better? There's enough detail. I'll say this. Five years ago, I would have said number two, 100% is a better email. I'm leaning towards something in the middle now. What's wrong with number one? I, there's too much fluff in number two. Too much fluff. But there's no question on what we're asking for. Number one, there's an assumption of a level of knowledge. I think that's very dangerous. When you shoot an email, there is no context. You're assuming context. So watch out for that. Concise, um, useful words, not space killers. Again, do keep your audience engaged and interested. We want them to read the report and understand the message. I was working with a class on Friday, and we talked specifically to this. I asked him, what the, what's your audit report for? What's the, what's the intention? What are you trying to accomplish with your audit report? You guys tell me. What are you trying to accomplish with your audit report? It's not a rhetorical question. I'd love to hear from somebody. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> Communicate the findings, right? Okay, that's a good start. Keep going. What else? What, what's the nature? What are we trying to do with that report? Yes, ma'am. Provide information for decision makers to do what with? Change. Ultimately, the report isn't a record of what we did. The report is a medium to, to facilitate change. Do you guys agree with that? So that's what's key is to make sure that we are communicating at an appropriate level. But again, hopefully keeping it as concise as possible. Complete and correct. We're gonna be able to paint the picture, introduce, support and reiterate your key points. Truthful, accurate, and honest. If you don't know, admit it. What does it do to perception of you when you admit you're wrong? What does it do? Thoughts? You know, Ryan told me, he killed me on this one, because he said, no, the group is really interactive. <laughs> is it, does it help if I say there's no wrong answer? There are wrong answers, but I'm just going to go ahead and say there are no wrong answers, so it makes you feel better about answering. Yeah. What does it do to the perception of you when you admit that you've done something wrong or you went down the wrong path? Who said that? I heard it. Say it louder. It should give you, now if you're wrong all the time, that's a much bigger issue. <laughs> But if I go down the wrong path and I own it, I'm accountable for my mistakes. It should give you much more credibility. Don't you guys agree with that? I think there is, and I know from, I'm gonna sound like an old man right now, uh, from the younger generation, there seems to be an accountability issue a lot of times. So I think it's very healthy to be accountable for your issues. Captivate. We've got to make sure that, that what we're saying or what we're communicating is interesting. Uh, do you need more detail? Do you need less detail? What's going to get the message across in the simplest form possible? Um, compelling language that encourages action. We're going to talk. Do I have a slide in here? I do. I think I do. 
um, filler words. Uh, if we wanted to say it was very interesting or it was really great, do those words belong in an audit report? In y'all's opinion. A lot of these things, try to eliminate these words out of your vocabulary too. You say, well, he was a really nice guy. Can't we just say he's a nice guy? Is that necessary? I had somebody in class talking about report writing. They were really concerned about an issue. So she put in the report, audit is gravely concerned about this issue. Guys, you do not want to put gravely. First off, you should never use the word grave or gravely. <laughs> Hopefully an audit report. But we shouldn't, uh, the, her boss caught it and just crossed it out. We can just say that internal audit is concerned about this issue. There's ways to say it without putting the emotion into it. Because when they see a word like that, that might elicit a negative response. Which of these is more captivating? Two very simple emails. <laughs> one is much more concise than the other, right? But I think one is much more captivating. Would you guys agree with that? Hopefully number one is more captivating to you. It's a little fluffy though. It's a little too much. You could probably eliminate 30, 40% of that and still get your message across. Let me ask you guys this. Do you, do you uh, utilize one word emails? Yes, no, thanks. Okay. Everything we're talking about too, the relationship is not built yet. So you're still trying to foster a good first impression, second impression. What do you guys, do you guys write, uh, do you guys send one word emails? Raise your hands if you do. Thanks, okay, yes, no. There's nothing wrong if you do. Raise your hands, own it. The rest of you guys don't. Raise your hands if you don't as a whole. Okay, eight people raise their hands. <laughs> yes, sir. Skype, are you talking about through just like, uh, like verbal? No. Oh, just yes. chat. Yeah. Okay. So I am. Yes. Let's let's talk about that. I am tends to lead towards much shorter communication. Um, I am is more informal, but I wouldn't let it go too informal, if that makes sense. With texting language, like I wouldn't brb or lol. Again, until you have. It's all about relationships, right? Once you have the strong relationship, you can do a lot of things. But until then, I think, would I say thanks via uh, Skype? Yeah. Would I tend to send a one word email that says thanks? I tend not to, I'll tell you why. I saw a hand up. Yes, sir. What is uh, the risk of being short in the communication and being rude? Are you making a point or are you asking a question? Because I think you're making a point too. <laughs> Because I think the point was inherently in that question. Someone could mistake an email that says thanks as curt, maybe a little bit rude. Do I want to take a chance in someone misinterpreting the emotion in the email? You don't, guys. Email is, there's no emotion to it, or you, should, you need to make sure it's emotionally neutral. Does that make sense? That's why I tend not to send one word emails to people I don't have good rapport with. Because they could mistake it. I've got a good friend, I've known him for 20 years, he's one of my biggest clients. He sends me emails all the time that say, okay. I ask him a question, he says, okay. It's a yes or no question, he says, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to respond to that. I don't know what it means. It's like, okay. <laughs> so I give him a thumbs up right back, right? That's why when I say thanks, I would say, Danny, thanks for sending this email. A lot of you guys probably thinking, I won't send that email at all because I don't want to clutter someone's email box. But here's my theory on, on relationships with intro auditors. Guys, tell me if you agree or disagree. People are looking for a reason not to like us a lot of times. You know, they might not mind you, but they're looking almost nitpicking at what you do because you're an auditor. And so we gotta watch out, we gotta be extra careful with that relationship. You've gotta be, to me, the key, well, I think it's a good theory on life. People help the people they like. 
people don't help the people they don't like. So as an auditor, you're asking for things that, yes, they have to do, but from their perspective, they might not, it's not their priority. So I strongly believe in being nice all the time. Probably overly nice all the time. Do you guys agree or disagree? What do you think? Anybody disagree with that? Please, again, different perspectives are very healthy and I, and I love to have the conversations. I just don't want them to have an opportunity to throw to throw, throw stones at me. I don't want them to have an opportunity to say, now he did this, and now I don't like, or I'm, I'm gonna make his life more difficult. So I tend to not say send one word emails because I don't want them to misinterpret it, and that's not a sentence, that's a word. Thank you, it's actually a sentence. So I'd probably say someone's name and then thank you, or thanks for sending that. Because I wanna make sure they know I appreciate what they did. Even though they're supposed to do it, I still appreciate it. One word email is too concise. Yeah, I think, I think they are until you have that good relationship. Conversational. Raise your hand if you've ever been talking to a coworker or, uh, yeah, let's just go with coworker, and you felt like they were talking down to you. You guys know the term talking down to somebody? Raise your hand if you've ever had that happen. Assume everybody in here has had that happen one time or another. It doesn't make you feel too good. They probably aren't doing it intentional either. You want to make sure you're talking with somebody, not to them. Does that make sense? We want to make sure that we connect, hopefully on a little bit of a personal level, uh, personalized experience, make them connect. I talk about my kids all the time because a lot of people can connect with kid stories. They can relate. I talk to my dogs all the time. People can connect with that. So personalize it at times to make them connect with the message. Courteous, talk with, not to. Ultimately, let's ask this question. What's the goal of internal audit? What's y'all's goal inside the organization? What are you trying to do? Add value. Who said that? Is that a worn out term? <laughs> you know what I mean? It almost sounds consultant-y because people don't define what value is. I agree with what you said, but let's keep going. What are we trying to do? Help manage. Help manage to do what? Control. Improve controls? Yeah, but I think that's almost an audit-centric answer, but I agree with you, that's very fair. Well, yeah, I wish I had a bell going off. Said so, ding, 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 ding. That's right. Yes. <laughs> if you look at the definition in the red book, it says we're there to try to help the organization achieve their objectives. Do your clients realize that, or do they think you're trying to hinder them from achieving their objectives? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, you're being there. You're stopping me from doing my job, right? That's what yeah. they say. And making sure that they understand, no, we're trying to do this you know, in a risk-based conscious and risk-based mind. So I recommend a lot of times starting with the Red Book definition and making sure they understand, I am not here to hurt you. I'm here to help you. Give me a chance, and I think we'll prove that value. I just said value, too. <laughs> Concrete. Otters have a very bad reputation of being ambiguous. What's, what's the auditor's question uh, answer to any yes, no question? Depends. <laughs> That's exactly right. That answer drives me nuts. And a lot of situations we're gonna talk about today, it depends. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential answers based on the situation. But the more we can come with concrete answers, guys, the better relationship we're gonna have. The more straightforward, the better. <clears throat> All right, shifting away from our seven C's. How do you guys build rapport with your clients? First off, is rapport important? Yes or no? I heard one person say yes. <laughs> is having a good rapport with your clients important, yes or no? Yes. 
Can you do your job efficiently and effectively without having good rapport? That's a great question. I think it's, you can still get it done, but I don't know if you're gonna do it efficiently or effectively. So how do you guys build rapport with your clients? <laughs> Who said that? You're not allowed to say anything the rest of the day. <laughs> she said depends. <laughs> What'd you say? Just, just engaging in general conversation, right? Um, how many of you guys, and, and again, I'm just gonna ask this question, how many of you guys know, it's a tough question too, how many of you guys know if your main clients that you see routinely, the name of their kids? Raise your hand if you do. Saw two hands go up, that's it. Three, does it matter? Does it matter? You better believe it matters. My kids, my son's name is Caleb, he's 10, my daughter's name is Leora, she's nine. When people remember their names, say, how's, how's your son? Not just how's your son, but how's Caleb doing in soccer? That means something to me. That means they cared enough to do what? To listen and remember. What do you do when you don't remember somebody's name? You guys are all in those situations. Heck, I'm sure we're gonna have some later day and tomorrow where I'm gonna have people come up to me and I will not remember your name. I'm pretty good with names though. What do you do? You just play it off and say, hey chief, hey buddy. <laughs> good to see you, man. Do you do that? What do you do? It's not the phones. <laughs> Who said ask? I own it. I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, or I'm sorry, tell me your name again. I'd rather own it. And again, be accountable for not remembering than trying to play it off. Every time you call someone buddy or man or chief, people know you don't remember <laughs> their name. Do you guys agree with that? <laughs> Especially when it's someone you're supposed to remember. Uh, my wife and I, we went to this Christmas party where she used to work for years. Six years straight, went to this Christmas party at a jewelry dealership in Dallas. Every time I would walk in, this guy would say, he would say hi to my wife, and then he would say, nice to meet you to me. Met me six times. <laughs> By the fourth time, I started making up names. I started making up names that this physical appearance do not fit into. Very ethnic names that Caucasian Danny does not fit into at all. He never caught one of them. What was he doing? He was just going on to his next sentence. He went into sales mode immediately. Did I ever buy anything from him? No. Do I tell everybody in Dallas not to buy from him? Yes. <laughs> because if he was a really good salesman, after six times he would remember, he would at least remember me and remember that Muhammad is not my name. <laughs> Other ways you build rapport, yes. You build rapport by talking to people. You build rapport by listening. What else? How much time should you spend building rapport? This is a great question. You're gonna have to tell me if you agree or disagree with this answer too. It depends on the culture, 100% agree. 100% agree. Latinos, half an hour? I was gonna say, I'd say even more so, right? Yeah. I know when I've been to, uh, specifically Mexico, we spend a lot more time building relationships and then doing the work. Because if they don't know you, they're not gonna trust you. I think to a certain extent that applies everywhere, but I agree with you, it's very cultural. Uh, every minute you spend getting to know your clients, building rapport, should save you time on the back end. Because if they like you, they're gonna get you those responses quicker. They're gonna get you the information quicker. So I'm not saying spend 30 hours talking to somebody, but should you invest some time in building a relationship? Yes, because I think overall it's gonna make your audit more efficient. Yes, ma'am. Like in East Asia, for me, I feel like, unless you have a meal with them, that relationship Unless you have a meeting with them? 
meal. <laughs> I think she just asked me out to dinner. That's... <laughs> no, you know what? That's fair. Where, 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 where do you live? I'm East Asia. East Asia, yeah. No, I appreciate that because I would say in Latin America, I would say that I would apply some too, right? Because I know when I went to uh, Mexico, we went to dinner when we got there and then worked the next day. But until we had that meal, but in uh, North America, I'd say that's not necessary, but building relationships still is. So thank you, good point. Some rapports, I feel, are impossible to build. Some rapport is impossible to build? It is inappropriate for Japan, for Korea. If you're a woman, it's gonna be very hard to break into. You need to get a sake first. Yeah, you, you need, well, yes, you need to get to the sake first. <laughs> get to the sake first to build a relationship. But That's funny. I, but sometimes I think yeah. it's, it's inappropriate, mm -hmm. and it's therefore I would say impossible. Then you have to get somebody else to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I I understand exactly what you're saying, especially some people too. I was asked, well, when do you know when it's time to move on to business? You'll know when you ask somebody if, if you were talking about kids, and you ask them, well, what do you guys do this weekend? and their answer is, does it matter? Then it's probably time <laughs> to talk about business. I think you know you get a feel for it, but I think your point is well taken. In certain cultures, it's gonna be much more challenging, so you might have almost a mediator to help with help, help build that relationship a little bit, too. I, I, tend, to, I, I tend to swap it off, I, I tend to give it away. The relationship is impossible. Yeah. 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 Always? Sorry? Always impossible? No, it's not always. And you're talking about with males, I assume, correct? If it's a very male dominated culture. Yeah. It takes too long. You want, I, I, can't, I can't wait until somebody says, uh, does it matter what I do on the weekend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might take like a year. <laughs> um, I think that's fair. But again, if it's a recurring client, you've got to continue to at least try while getting your work done? If, would you agree with that? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you build rapport with folks? I think a lot of times you can just check their me wall, I call it. Everybody, raise your hand in here if you do not have something personal up in your cube or office. Something personal, yeah. It's very rare and you work from home, then you definitely have something <laughs> personal in your office. It's very rare that you see someone that doesn't have anything personal that you can relate to, either something they're interested in, pictures, etc. There's something you can capture. What's the most common subject to talk about when you don't know somebody? So here's my question to you guys. These guys said weather, and I, I agree with that. Should you talk about the weather? Or sports. sports, yes, but I think uh, what are you what are you doing when you tell somebody, hey, how's the weather, guys? In Dallas, in July, in Texas, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's always gonna be hot here. It's hot. <laughs> you're, you're pointing out the obvious, right? Are you telling somebody when you're talking about the weather? Now, if it's an aberration. You know, if it's a big uh, snowstorm, tornado, hurricane, whatever, that's something to talk about. But if you're going to tell me, hey, it's hot in Dallas in July, you're, like, you're basically telling me, I have nothing to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys agree or disagree with that? Seriously. Amen. <laughs> so I would watch out for that, guys. I think, again, a lot of people default to weather. Try to pick something else up. Now, a lot of times you say, well, I can't really ask them if they have kids or if they're married so I can, you know, personalize. So what's a way to do that without asking them? Talk about yourself. Maybe mention, oh, my son had a soccer tournament this weekend. If they want to talk about their kids, raise your hand if you know a parent that doesn't like talking about their kids. I mean, it's like never, it's not unheard of, right? Everybody likes talking about their kids. You say something, they're going to bring something up. You'll have something to relate to. So there's a way to, I think, elicit 
some dialogue without actually asking <coughs> questions at times. Eye contact in uh, North America and certain cultures is extremely important. Other cultures, it's rude. Yes. Almost, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it could be considered rude. Again, depending on your culture, understand what those cultural norms are. If you can't look me in the eye in North America or in Western culture, what does that tell me? I can't trust you. You've got something to hide. So those little things, those little things you pick up on are extremely important, again, depending on your culture. We're not going to do the handshake exercise, but... Is a handshake, is a greeting, is that relevant still in corporate America? Reggie, do you think yes, it is? Say again? According to the news, it is. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. The rest of you guys don't think handshakes are relevant anymore? Yes. No, that's what I'm talking about. In corporate America, are greeting somebody formally first time you meet them or a handshake? Is that relevant still? Yes. I think it is. Yes. Understand the, and again, there's a whole exercise we do, but it's more relevant to to, to uh, uh, what, the Western uh, hemisphere. But you always remember, don't you, when somebody has a weird handshake, don't you? <laughs> you do, don't you? So you don't want to be the person. There you go. I think, yeah. <laughs> or somebody that overgrips your hand. I mean, it just, you always remember it. So don't be that person, guys. A nice, quick greeting, an introduction, very important. Uh, from the Skype standpoint, you brought that up too. I think you tend to, with Skype, just less uh, rapport building, but you still can build a relationship. It's much easier to build a relationship in person. Skype makes it a little more difficult, but again, I think you can. Uh, I always look at LinkedIn when I'm meeting somebody for the first time. Maybe look at what school they went to, look at where they worked, etc. So I have some idea as topics come up, I can shift into different topics of conversation. But again, I think you just tend to more, I mean, less rapport building on LinkedIn, on Skype than more. What do people, if you're on Skype and you want to get people's attention, what do people always listen for? One word. Everybody. This is universally accepted. What do they listen for? What'd you say? I guess you're not going to say it again. <laughs> what do they listen for? Oh my gosh, I stumped you guys, did I? <laughs> One word people, everybody listens for. Not high. It's not the same word for everybody. Their name. Always know who's on the phone and be able to use their names. Because they might not have listened to a word you just said, let me make that clear. But once you say their name, they're going to listen going forward, or at least for a short period. So if you're doing a, um, a web-based call, always know who's on the call and be able to use their name. Make sure you call people by the right name, too. <laughs> no, and I think this is a big deal. My name is Danny. Oh, I thought you were Danny. That was funny. Um, I used to go by Daniel. That's my formal name. I stopped when I was 18. Anybody that calls me Daniel either knew me when I was a kid or doesn't know me at all. Because that might be my signature line at times, or it might have been in an email at one time. Or another. So making sure... If there's are there any Roberts in here? Yeah, Robert could be Robert, Rob, Robbie, Bob, Bobby. It'd be like seven different names. Make sure you know their name or what they go by. I think that's really important. Um, active listening. How many of you guys are really, really good listeners? Am I going to challenge that? Tell me some of the things you do, if you don't mind. Anything specific to remember or listen well? For instance, when people speak about their own history, that's something that I always put attention. I, when you ask about the names of the kids and all of that, 
sometimes I, I don't perform through state, but at least I know what the kids normally got. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's hard to remember at all times, but like, what are they inter interested in? Or give me just in general their age range. Because if, you know, if you have a three-year-old, and I think your three-year-old, hey, isn't your uh, son graduating from high school? That means I didn't listen to anything. <laughs> so, but if I at least know they're a toddler, you know, again, you can, you can get there. Chris, is there anything specific you do to be a good listener? Any techniques that you use? I look into their eyes. Yeah, eye contact for some people works very well. The reason I bring it up, everybody listens differently. You know, we'll, we'll talk about some good listening techniques, but in order to recall, remember, everybody listens differently. So you've got to figure out what works really well for you. So here's my question, do not blurt out the answer. This is actually pretty easy. What are my kids' names and what are their ages? Do not blurt out the answer. Raise your hand if you remember. This was less than five minutes ago. Raise them high, own it, man. You should be very proud of yourself, you can remember. I've got a room of 130, four people remember. <laughs> so you, you do understand the importance of active listening. Who knows it? Caleb, 10. Caleb, 10? And it, it sounded like Leona, like. That's very good. Uh, it's, it's Lee or uh, but you were, you were right on, nine. Give the gentleman a hand, man. That's, that was five minutes ago. Everybody else in the room that didn't know that? Should be a little embarrassed, let's be honest. I'm not that important, I realize that. But you guys get the point. That those little things matter a lot. Um, how many of you guys write things like that down? Some people in here think, that's a little creepy. Why are you writing down my kids' names? <laughs> No, look, I'll, I'll take notes on people. Now, I won't be creepy about it. Like the first time I meet somebody, I won't like troll their Facebook page and say, hey, I saw your three-year-old had a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese this weekend. That's weird. <laughs> but do I want to know if it comes up in conversation? Do I want to remember? Yeah, I think that's appropriate. I want to at least remember, if I can remember their names, if that helps me writing them down, putting them in notes, I think that's helpful. Because again, I'm always about building a relationship. So how many of you guys are good active listeners? If you're a good active listener, you would do something right now. You'd raise your hand and you'd say, yes, Danny, I'm a very good active listener, and let me tell you why. If you understand the definition of active listening, that's what it is. It's taking something that someone said and bringing it back to them to show that I am listening to you. This isn't just about active listening, this is about listening all together. How many of you guys know the percentage you recall on a day-to-day -day basis? What percentage of what you hear do you recall? You know, it's, it's, luckily it's not that low. She said five, I heard 10. It can be up to 25 to 50% you might recall. But think about that, 25%, that's all you remember. 25%, it's kind of depressing, isn't it? Think about how much of a better Auditor, father, husband, wife, mother, you'd be if you actually, I don't know, listen and remember what people say. So there's little techniques, but I will tell you, and I'm going to reiterate this, everybody listens differently. If I'm staring at some, if I'm looking at somebody in the eyes and I'm focusing on the conversation, that might actually be counterproductive to my listening. I need a distraction to listen better. Does that make sense to anybody here? If I have a TV on or a radio on, I tend to listen better. Silence drives me kind of crazy. The demons inside my head start to, start to talk. I'm kidding, I think. Am I kidding? Yes, I am. Um, so uh, some people are very different. Uh, my son, for example, is like that. He's got a, uh, a doctor's note to chew gum in class because it helps him listen. So everybody listens differently. Some facts, we listen at basically 200 words per minute, we think at 2,000 words, big difference. We are preoccupied and forgetful, 20% of the time we remember what we hear. All right, let's talk about something. If you're building a presentation, don't do this, where the words fly in like this. 
It's, it's too much. Do you guys agree or disagree? It's too much. You disagree? Who said disagree? Tell me why. But you don't have them flying in, do you? You have them like this? You have them flying in? Do like, do they do circles and go <laughs> Okay, yeah, so they're doing the same thing, so I think that's fair. I'm more, I like to see it visually and go through it. I think that's fair, but I'm talking about just over animating. You can't over animate and it takes away from your presentation. So I think it's a fine balance. I tend to use a little bit of animation, but I use pictures. But balance it out. Listening optimized, ignoring phone calls, distractions. Again, I like being distracted, I listen better. But what did I find? Every time I'm staring at my phone while someone's talking, it's rude. So I try to balance that out. I'll, I actually usually keep a handkerchief in my pocket, and I'll put my hand in my pocket and I'll, I'll rub the handkerchief uh, to get, I mean, to help me focus, if that makes any sense. There's little tricks that I've used for years because, again, I don't want to come off rude. I'm not trying to be rude, but it comes off that way. I'm looking at the other person again. Eye contact, very important. Concentrate on the flow, let's not focus on that. Verbal active listening, I see your point. Mirroring is a technique where you would not repeat everything they say word for word. It's more of a, yeah, that's called mocking. My daughter does that really well. Mirroring is more speed, voice tone, etc. So if they're talking fast, you tend to speed up your response as well. You were pretty upset by this, please tell me more. It's telling the, telling the speaker, I hear you, I understand what you're saying, and now I'm gonna to respond to what you're saying. Barriers to active listening, not keep an open mind by letting biases interfere. If you've ever heard somebody speak, let's say a political candidate, because I think this is relevant to most of us, that we don't like, you don't listen to the word or word the person says. That is not good active listening, that's not good critical. Take your biases away or acknowledge your biases. Monopolizing the conversation, 70-30 rule. You want to make sure you're talking at most 30% of the time. You're letting them talk 70%. To that point, with interviews, we're supposed to ask open-ended questions, right? Anybody in here, ask me any open-ended question. I'm going to prove to you that that's not an open-ended question. Anything. I'm an open book. I will answer any question right now. Ask me an open-ended question. What do I think of what? Oh. Uh. First off, that's a that is not an open-ended question. That's closed-ended. But let me say this: I'm not dumb enough to answer that question. Regardless of what my personal views are, I know better. But that's actually a pretty good question. But that's not really open-ended, is it? Because I could say, "What do you think about Donald Trump?" I don't. Or I could just give you a thumbs up. How? How old am I? Forty-two. But is that an open-ended question? Because I can answer the question with one word or a short sentence. It's not necessarily open-ended. So someone asked me a truly open-ended question. When did you stop smoking? When did I stop smoking? I ne never smoked before. Or I don't smoke. Say it again. Other open ended questions. Someone give me a good one. Let's see, first off, what's your name? Carlos. Carlos asks, give me your thoughts on your book. And I could speak for days about how wonderful it is. That made it. <laughs> but what did he do that everybody else didn't do? He made a statement versus asking a question. If he would have said, what are your thoughts on your book? I said, it's good. I could just say one word, two words. But more of a statement. And he opened it a question. is isn't a question at all. It's a statement. Does that make sense? If you really want to force conversation on people, ask truly open-ended questions. Great job. 
I'm thinking ahead. If you're thinking ahead to your next question or your comment, what are you not doing? Not listening. I tend to not give out handouts. If you're in a meeting, you give out handouts, what do people do? You read them. They spend the first five minutes reading the handout. So you can send them to them ahead of time. That might not necessarily help. I try to give out any documents after the fact, but I try not to hand them paper. Yes. Great question. He said, can you focus when you're taking notes? Personally, I, I can do it, but only to not for long periods. I always recommend when you're doing an audit interview, if this is possible, I don't know if it is, have one person taking notes, one person doing the interview. That's ideal. Um, again, I don't know if that's possible all the time. It's very difficult to stay in the flow of back and forth conversation and take notes. If I have to do it myself, I might pause and say, give me one second, let me finish this thought. And I might read back for him what I just wrote, just to make sure we're on the same page. But in either situation, I have one person taking notes, one person conducting the interview. Not going back and forth, not switching. I have one person, an intern, a staff, that's there to take notes. They can jump into the conversation, ask follow-ups, but I want them there taking notes. Are you the same? Yeah. It's, um, it's very difficult to take notes and conduct the interview. How often do you guys communicate with your clients during the audit? Every day? Formally, I'm assuming you guys at least communicate status, et cetera, on a maybe a weekly, bi-weekly basis. But we have continuous, transparent communication all the time. You guys agree with that? How many of you guys, and you're recurring audits, how many of you guys connect with your auditees, your clients, outside of the audit cycle? Maybe during the holidays, say, hey, or remembering a birthday, say, hey, it's your son's birthday coming up, isn't it? You're laughing. You don't think, do you think that, what do you think about that? Am I crazy? Okay. Sometimes it's a lot, guys. But every time you do that, that person's not gonna, not gonna forget you. And again, you're not gonna be the auditor anymore. You're gonna be Carlos or someone else. Yes, sir? I think the best approach is to work with the audit itself. Say, for example, you are doing a section, so you don't take the file and you do it on your own. But you have to sit with them, discuss with them, go through with them, ask the question. Yeah. Actually, they are doing the audit for ourselves. You know, it, it's a great point. What was your name? Hillary. Hillary? Yeah. Um, uh, great and, and continuous transparent communication throughout. We talked about establishing or more. To Hillary's point, presenting audit observations. It's a great point. And when you go to them and say, I've got a finding for you, or here, we found something, that's going to naturally irritate a lot of people. It's going to work with some folks, but I think this softer approach makes the rest of the audit, the reporting, much more efficient. Let's talk about transparency. Are you guys, this, are you guys transparent in your audit approach? Do you tell them, in your planning of your audits, do you talk to them at the end of planning and tell them, here's the areas that are high risk? You guys, and, and verify that with them? Yes. Got to do that, guys. If you're not doing that, you're doing a disservice to them, but here's, take a step further, you're going to waste a lot of time. Um, are you walking them through how we're going to test something? Anybody doing that? Or maybe giving them the audit work program, discussing the audit work program. I think the main concern is what? They're going to go in and clean up which I think is a fair concern. Overall though, we're looking for systemic issues inside the organization to facilitate change. Can they correct the systemic issues in two, two weeks? I don't think so. I think that's physically impossible. Correcting and falsifying, two very different things, okay? Cleaning up a little bit. But how many of you guys have had an audit finding and you've shown it to your client and they look at you like, okay, who cares? 
Raise your hands. Really feel good about your value inside the organization when that happens. This actually helps eliminate some of those, I think, more meaningless findings. And we can be a little more, again, transparent, make sure they understand what we're gonna do. They can't correct the systemic issues, guys. It's not gonna happen. So, and what are we really doing? We're making sure the policy, I'm not telling them our sample. I'm telling them in general what we're gonna do. What's that really doing? That's all we're doing is interpreting their policy a lot of times, right? or auditing the documentation of the control they have. They already know what we're gonna do or how we test it, probably but nobody's ever said that to them. That kind of transparency builds <coughs> trust. The more transparent you are, there should be no surprises. Do we agree with that? We're not talking about fraud auditing here, guys. Let me make that clear. These are just good operational control related audits. There should be no surprises at any time. We agree? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. How about when you do the surprise audit? So, how so like a, like a, give me an example of a, why you do a surprise audit. Or, or what? We are, we are that could be okay, totally different ball game. So in financial institutions, you'll do branch audits and you won't give them any, any notice. You're doing that because you want to surprise them. Yeah, we're not going to communicate that. I agree with you 100%. But they should know what we're going to be looking at though a lot of times, right? You're doing a branch audit at a bank. You're looking at the uh, you're looking at the uh, uh, the books, the um, cash registers, making sure everything's correct. There's been reviews, all the numbers tied. Uh, if it's fraud audit, totally different. I'm not going to do. This changes the approach completely. But on our operational slash controls reviews, we should be able to be transparent, right? Continuous transparent communication, kickoff meetings, making sure they have a, do most of your clients understand what you're going to do overall? Yes? If they don't, guys, spend the time to make sure they do. The more confusion, the less cooperation they'll have. Um, for my clients, I've always used a one-page marketing sheet that will outline, here's the process, here's your role in each of these steps, here's our role. Because again, I want them, the more they understand, the less, the less they're gonna be scared of this process. This shouldn't be a scary process. This is a trick on meetings, and <laughs> it might have played out a little bit today. Always schedule too much time for an interview or a meeting. Schedule an hour, how long should you actually speak for? How long should you plan on conducting the interview for? You guys know? If you schedule an hour, how long? Anybody know where I'm going with this? 45 minutes, 40 minutes tops. Why? Why? Always end early. Like you guys, somebody cut into my time today, but that's okay. Will we end on time? Yes. Will we end a minute early? Yes, we will. Why? Now, again, I'm not saying this applies to the sessions before me. But when the time is up at 345, you guys might really like what I'm talking about. Half the room is going to lose their attention real quick. Go a minute over. 80% of the room. Go two minutes over, that two minutes feels like four years. <laughs> Again, I think it's, there's situations where I, I think that doesn't apply, but in the whole, guys, when you're doing a meeting, don't go over. Don't even get close to going over. Give them five minutes of their life back. It's, it sounds a little ridiculous, but I think it means, it means a lot. It also shows what? that you appreciate their time, their schedule, and you're organized. Those little things, again, mean a lot. Uh, Hillary brought this, I mean, he destroyed my little group exercise here. How do you approach audit ease? I don't tell them it's a finding. I talk about results. Help me interpret those results. All right, this is a good question. 
So I think as auditors, we tend to struggle with convincing people to change at times. How many of you guys are, what's a good method to help convince somebody to change their process when they're not interested in change? Do you guys know people that don't like changing at all? Raise your hands. My old man, he's, I think he's 71 now. He worked at Raytheon TI, Texas Instruments, for 43 years. I mean, he still does the classic, like, 70s comb over to hide, like, five strands of hair to hide his, hide his, like, I mean, he's, he's got my head of hair right here. Still wears the same old pair of pants he wore in the 70s. Drives the same old truck. He's very well off. He doesn't like to change. How do you convince somebody that X, Y, Z is a good idea if they don't like to change? How do you convince them? Say it again. So demonstrate the output, sell the benefits, right? The problem is, and I agree with you for most people, but if they don't like to change, changing is much more costly than the benefits. So how else? How do you sell change to somebody that doesn't want to change? Say it again. Make them to like it. Accomplish it. Get them to like it. Accomplishments, etc. Sell them on their um, legacy. I think again. I think it, that works at times. I think there's some people that just don't want to change. Anybody else? Make them a change agent. What do you mean by that? Make them a change agent. Both they're in the process of change or something. Let's take it a step further. I sold my business, I've been doing it for 10 years. I sold it seven years ago and I bought it back four years ago. When I sold it, my kids were three and two and we were gonna go out and celebrate. I told my wife, I said, hey, you know, let's go celebrate, this is great. She's like, great, let's go out to a really nice steakhouse on a Saturday night with a three and a two year old. I don't know if you guys have young kids, that's a bad idea. <laughs> so throughout the day, I kept thinking about it. My son likes eating, he likes, you guys have Denny's, IHOP, stuff like that, you guys know what I'm talking about? If you don't, just a breakfast place. My son didn't have breakfast that day, and he kept on saying, Daddy, I really want breakfast, I want some eggs. So I kept on hinting at my wife, I said, man, the kids didn't sleep well all night, he didn't get his breakfast, they didn't nap. So I did it three or four times, like, man, I don't know if the kids are gonna make it tonight, it's gonna be a, it could be a rough night. So about five o'clock in the afternoon, the kids are a little grumpy. My wife comes to me. She says, hey, I don't think we should go tonight. I'm like, what? Why would we want to go and celebrate this momentous occasion? And then she says, oh, the kids are a little grumpy. They want to go to the diner, the local diner. Let's just do that and you and I can celebrate. That would have never happened if I told my wife, let's not go to the restaurant. If I was more direct. This way, I planted seeds with her, made her the change agent, basically, and manipulated, I mean, motivated. <laughs> but it's true, it's, it's, it's almost one and the same, guys. You can plant seeds of change around them and basically give them the idea and let them take credit for it. Does it matter who gets their credit? I don't think it does, because we're here to facilitate change. Let's talk about mode of communication. You've got in-person, phone, Skype, text, but I would forward them the response. I would say something along the lines of, John, thanks for your feedback. I'd really like to discuss this in person at your earliest convenience. Let me know and we can set something up. Is it a little sarcastic? I'm hoping, well, it's maybe a little sarcastic. Thanks for the feedback. You think I'm an idiot, but thanks for the feedback. <laughs> but if somebody doesn't think I know what I'm doing, don't you want to know that? I'd want to know that. So it is sincere. I really want that feedback. Similar, Brian, what you would do? Yeah. Again, I think CCing, et cetera, I don't know if you need to or not, but just remember, guys, when you get an emotionally charged email, don't respond with the same bad communication techniques that person used in the first place. Um, if you guys are traveling to cultures that you don't fully understand, I always say, 
somebody there, locals, you've got to make sure you're checking and making sure you understand the local culture. Um, there's a lot of good information out there, but again, the people, they're doing the work, especially if you're going somewhere you don't know, making sure to check with them ahead of time. I asked, I, I gotta admit, I asked Ryan, when I, I've never been to Bangkok, so he gave me some little cultural differences that were very helpful that I really wouldn't have considered at all. Those little things matter. Uh, a little summary on email versus phone versus face-to-face. -face. What's the optimal length for an email? Again, this is a very generic statement, so the answer could be depends, but you're not gonna say that because you know better. <laughs> What's the optimal length? Isn't that how you serve scotch? Like, two? I've never heard that term, four fingers for an email. <laughs> Font size? Yeah. Font size should be 12 almost at all times, right? Because when you get smaller, it's a little hard to see. But I've never heard that before, but that's, <laughs> that's not way off base. I think that's, that's probably fair. Did you make that up? You heard that somewhere. <laughs> Just what you, but did you hear that from somebody or that's, I mean, I never, next time I send an email though, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Two to three sentences, I think is fair. If you have to write multiple paragraphs, you need to consider, am I gonna lose my audience? If I have to scroll down to read your email, it's probably gonna to be too long. I'm not saying you don't send it. I think you need to realize that people aren't gonna read as much as you think. Two to three sentences. I had a, a chief auditor tell me, this applies to audit reports, but I think it applies to email too. He said, within 30 seconds, I need to know what your point is and do I need to keep reading or do I need to respond? 30 seconds. I might even lower that. I might say 15 to 20 seconds. I should be able to read your email and say, do I need to respond? What do I need to do? What's the action you're asking? Would you guys agree? It's got to be quick impact. Question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I see some people send an alert, long email alert. Yes. Uh, does it help, especially because uh, it will help if you can't do that now? So, going back to the link, I think you, you summarized it too. People that send long emails, I wait to read them. I don't respond right away because I know it's gonna take time to read. And plus in the back of my mind, I'm asking why didn't they just call me or come by and talk to me? Why is there so much in this email? Again, long emails are necessary when you have big project teams, et cetera, at times. But when I have to have three, four paragraphs and I have to scroll down to read it, I can't read it quick. So on my phone, I'm probably not gonna read it right away. I'm probably gonna skip it. So that's a good point. You gotta keep that in mind. Yes, sir. I don't know how to deal with the entire institution where ads or something. I have a bad body of all the same email. And the person does not respond or don't receive any feedback from that person. Yes, they ignore you. According to the culture in this country, you don't have to request again or to ask again. So, let, let's talk about that because I think that's, that, that's a good subject that kind of wraps up email. So you've got somebody that's not responsive. You're going to send it to them via email, but you're going to swing by their desk if you can geographically. You might ping them on Skype, but not to be overly intrusive. But people will not respond. Um, what I've used with some of my clients is they call it something that during kickoff, we'll call it a service level agreement that basically says, and these are what your status updates are for, right? If you're having status updates every week, you're telling the management team, hey, this guy's not responding to me. Not like that, but you're telling them. Plus, um, if, I, if I go ahead and state ahead of time, if you're not responsive to two emails, I'm gonna copy your manager. I don't like copying the manager, let me make that clear. I'm gonna give them every chance to respond without doing that. Because once you start copying people out of the blue, you're gonna burn that bridge. Their relationship is gone. 
You guys agree with that? But if you establish that criteria ahead of time, during kickoff and say, hey, if any of your team isn't responsive, not to get them in trouble, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna copy the manager, I think you can do that. I might, with the next email, I might send them a follow-up. I might forward the same email and follow up and say, hey, I wanna make sure you got this email. My boss, John, is asking me about this, so he's asked me going forward to copy him on these emails and ask me to cop and ask me to copy your boss too. So I'm going to use my boss as the scapegoat, so I can copy the bosses moving forward. But I'm going to give them the opportunity to respond before I have to do that, because if I start CCing people, guys, out of the blue, you're going to burn the relationship. So those some of you people are thinking, well, I'm going to BCC him. You're not thinking that, are you? <laughs> Don't do that, please. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I agree with you, but people will take it the wrong way. For, that's my experience. If you establish that criteria ahead of time, that hey, after two non-responsive, I'm gonna make sure we loop everybody in, I agree with you. But if you copy the boss out of the blue, I think most people will think, you're telling on me. And, and again, that might be a cultural thing, but it, it, some people will ask to get copied on everything. And if you're copied on everything, that's a different story. But I'm just not going to copy the boss without at least giving him a warning ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. For me, recently I'm doing for Sandy Just to call people by Skype, by Skype. Yeah. Or face to face. And more I spend, once I want to focus on Yemen. So that these people, when I miss them, so their answer is very. I agree with you. Once people talk to you, get to know you, see your face. They're more apt to responding. They can ignore a faceless email, but it's harder to, to ignore somebody that I've talked to. 100% agree. Once you establish a little bit of rapport, it's gonna it's, you're gonna be more responsive. Does that help at all with your question? So with that, guys, after that whole spiel on making sure that was on time, we're gonna stop right here because we got two minutes left. <laughs> if you have any questions in the interim, uh, you know I'll be around today and I'm doing sessions tomorrow. Please. Come up, ask any questions. I'd be happy to have the conversation. Out of everything we do, guys, you represent the audit department, period. Everything you do reflects on that. <laughs> strong communication is gonna be the key to continuing to build such a strong audit department and a strong department with a great reputation. The better relationships you have, the easier work is gonna be. Remember, people help who they like. People don't help who they don't like. And with that, thank you very much.